también Julio Canal. Okay, whenever you are ready. Just one second, because something appeared on my screen. Uh, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Irene and all the other organizers for, for inviting us to, to give a talk uh, here. Um, so the plan is uh, to talk about this causality constraints on um, on corrections to Einstein gravity, and this is based on on a paper we put out earlier this year, and and also some ongoing work with uh, with Simon and also his awesome student Jia Li and and David uh, here at Caltech. Um, so the plan is that I will um, <clears throat> give kind of an introduction to the basic uh, ideas that we use to to constrain. Uh, Kind of modifications to gravity, and and then using these things, Simon will will give you the results, which lessons we we learned and we are learning using using this set of tools. And so, of course, our paper is not the only one. There's been uh, many papers over the last year and a half that have dealt with this topic in in, in effective theories in general. Um, but but we'll be focusing on on gravity today. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, so. Um, let me just say very briefly the kind of uh, theories that we're considering. We are uh, we know that at low energies, uh, essentially Einstein gravity is the is the only game in town, uh, and uh, this should be understood as an effective theory. So we have our Einstein-Hilbert term, and and then there can be some higher dimensional higher dimension operators that can modify this. And uh, today we'll be studying four dimensional Einstein gravity, uh, which uh, is supposed to describe our 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 world and. Um, and uh, there should be some some uh, higher derivative corrections, which, which with some Wilson coefficient, and these are suppressed by by some scale m, which is the scale of new physics that we'll have more to say about later. Okay, and apart from this, the only thing that we can do at low energies is to add additional light degrees of freedom. So, for instance, in supergravity or string theory, um, we have a uh, axiodilaton, we have a uh, uh, a B field, um, other other uh, massless fields, um, but but that's it. We kind of at low energies, uh, at low enough energies, that's that's everything we can do. And uh, similarly, there's all these other modifications of gravity that people consider, and and um, basically those are also theories with additional light degrees of freedom. For instance, F of R theories, one can always rewrite using a field redefinition using some kind of scalar field coupled uh, to gravity in, in some particular way. Okay, so uh, so Simon will have to say more about about precisely what what kind of scaling these Wilson coefficients have for us. Uh, so for now, you can ignore this. And uh, but the the goal of this program is to say something about these Wilson coefficients and to see uh, what are the consistency conditions that we can find and and we what we can learn about them. Okay, so uh, so the space of these the UV completions of this theory, which is something that. Um, Many people here are interested in is parameterized by these Wilson coefficients essentially, uh, and as I said, these are suppressed by by some high energy scale, um, and then there's some dimensionless uh, coefficient which I denote here for, with the tilde, and uh, and and these coefficients can be measured in an experiment, or uh, or they can be matched to some UV completion as we know very well. For instance, the the example of of string theory has some very particular values for these for these coefficients. Okay, and and there's uh, very general questions that we can ask uh, from the bottom up without knowing much about the UV completion, which is, for instance, how large can these Wilson coefficients be? Um, is there any any limit on on their size? Uh, what is the scale of new physics? Can we pinpoint uh, precisely at which scale these these things are supposed to enter? Which energies will will start to think? Okay, and and. At least for, for one of these questions, there's kind of a, na a naive answer. Uh, and actually, this is called naive dimensional analysis in, in the technical sense. And, and, and this is the usual expectation that this dimensional Wilson coefficient should be order one. Order one in practice means some power of, of four pi. Uh, but, uh, but this is just a guess. This is not, not a theorem. This is something which we think is natural. This is something that we expect for, for most theories. Um, Unfortunately, for, for Einstein, gravity means that if, if this is true, we are unlikely to measure these things anytime soon. Uh, uh, Julio, can, can I ask uh, a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so can these coefficients have running, like these dimensionless coefficients? Yes, of course, yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, so then it, the, the, whether you say it's one or four pi depends on scale. Like if you go to the deep IR, it can become 
are large that's, numbers. That's right. So today, uh, as I'll mention in a second, we're going to consider weakly couple theories, which means that we want we will be ignoring all of, all of those effects. But actually, I mean, we're, we're working on including loops in this story and, and seeing how, how they affect the bounds. But if, if you want, the, the basic lesson is that the bounds that we get, you can think of them as bounds on the Wilson coefficients at the scale of the cutoff. Okay, that's usually where one gets the, the strictest bounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so let's see. So these are the sort of questions we can, are there any more questions, by the way? Just feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, Okay, so um, so how are we going to study this? So there's a traditional way to think about uh, causality experiments and, and try to probe causality, and this is using gravitational scattering. Okay, and and the the way this is usually done is by thinking about forward scattering or, or the Regel limit. Uh, so this is the limit where the center of mass energy goes to infinity with fixed uh, momentum transfer t. And the reason why this probes causality is because this creates a tension, because essentially you're scattering things which in position space are essentially right on the light cone and, um, and, and forward. And that means that if there is anything wrong with your theory, um, then it's, it's, very, uh, it's very likely that, that the, this gravitational interaction will, will kick you out of the light cone and you will see some violation of causality. Okay? This is very different from, from, for instance, fixed angle uh, scattering where whenever you scatter two things at, at some fixed angle, then you always end up in the future light cone of the, of the past particle. So, so there's no tension there. Okay. So, so typically the high energy limit of, of scattering amplitudes is something that has been used to probe scattering. And just to make contact with, with people that have discussed this in the past, there's this beautiful paper by Kamanyo Edelstein, Maldazena, and Jibodeov, which uh, they study this kind of um, high energy iconal regime for, for graviton scattering. Okay. And, um, and, and they study the limit where uh, G times the center of mass energy is much greater than one, okay? So this is not the weak coupling limit. This is the semi-classical regime where we have um, some particles scattering in, in the background created by the other particle. So this is a classical scattering experiment, but which can be described using scattering amplitudes too. And in practice, what one does is one resumes a bunch of diagrams which uh, include a graviton exchange and, and uh, the amplitude is the exponential of some phase. So this is what's called the iconal phase, which in this particular example is some matrix. And here um, I'm showing it to you. So it's the diagonal elements just depend on G Newton. So this come directly from graviton exchange in Einstein gravity. And the diagonal elements are, are given by the R cubed coupling. And of course, this is a matrix because we are scattering gravitons of di different helicities from some, from some target. Okay. Um, so this is, a, this is a famous paper, so I'll, I'll, I'll review it very quickly, but uh, the basic idea is that um, uh, there's a time delay in this classical scattering experiment. So this is, uh, this is some semi-classical uh, process. And, um, and the, time, the time advance or time delay is given by some derivative of this, this phase, which is essentially the log of the amplitude. And if, if this matrix has a negative eigenvalue, this means that there, there will be a time advance for for some particular helicity uh, configuration, okay, some linear combination of the helicities, and in this case, um, uh, causality, which is the absence of that time advance, um, imposes some constraint on on this G G G G three coefficient, which is the coefficient of the R cubed operator, All right? And the constraint that it imposes is just so that you cannot get these negative eigenvalues here. And uh, if one wants to relate that to the sort of things that we were discussing, like this this UV cutoff. One has some some uh, some uh, parametric bound here, which uh, which is because of the fact that this is the impact parameter at which the scattering happens, and and that has to be uh, greater than 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 the, the one over the UV cutoff essentially. Okay, so so there's also an infrared logarithm because we're in four dimensions, and there's kind of long range gravitational interactions given by G Newton, but but uh, this is just a fact of life, and we 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 won't worry too much about this logarithm. Uh, today, okay. Um, okay, so go ahead. Yes, so the so this comes this kind of bounds come from imposing that there is there is no time delay. But no time quantum, advance. Sorry, no time advance. No time advance. But uh, but in in quantum gravity, would we would be okay with a small amount of time advance because things are not completely well defined, or is this something that one should well, be sharp? Th this is this is why why this bound is parametric. 
Okay, uh -huh. this is precisely why we we want to do better than than this. So so, so this less less here. What what is precisely encoding what what you said, which is okay. that okay, this we're working with NEFT. We're working in some semi classical setting, um, and we want to have a stronger statement about causality, okay. uh, about kind of quantum scattering amplitudes. Okay, and and that that's what we're going to do. All right. So as as I, as I just said, so there's some room for improvement. So these bounds are parametric; they're not sharp. Okay, and also I, the only coefficient that appears here is G3. There's also gauss bonin or like R squared in, in higher dimensions, but uh, which they also consider, but in, in general, this, this sort of a story is not sensitive to contact interactions, things like R to the fourth, the sort of things that, that we see in, in string theory all the time. Yeah. So sorry, and, so uh, sh should this bound be on the absolute value of G3 or really just G3? Uh, so this one, I think it, I, I don't remember, but I think it's um, you, you, the, the important thing is that this this bounding the size. The, the sign is not so important. And yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and, and I want to stress that this is again in this regime where G times S is much greater than one. Okay, so this is the semi classical regime. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do some things slightly differently. So these are these are going to be our assumptions. We're going to use also scattering amplitudes to, to uh, study causality. And, and its constraints on, on Wilson coefficients. And our assumptions are going to be the following. Um, so we're going to assume that we have at low energies, we just have gravity, we just have gravitons. Um, we can include matter too, uh, but we won't do that today. And that the amplitude has an EFT expansion. And in particular, this is an expansion where GES squared is, is much, much less than one, which is, uh, is the usual weak coupling regime. And, and essentially, this means that there's a parametric separation between these, these UV cutoff. Um, of our EFT and, and M Planck. Okay, so this is our assumption of weak coupling. We're going to assume quantum causality. So, uh, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, it, uh, how is causality encoding the S matrix? So, our assumption is that it's encoded in its analytic properties, essentially analyticity in the upper half plane and, and crossing symmetry. Okay. Um, Julio, even, sorry. The, so, the capital M here was the scale of new physics. Yes. Okay, so that's what you said. A separation between the scale of new physics and plan scale. So you need to have something below, like the string scale or that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. One could in, one could also consider kind of strongly coupled gravity where, where you just have M Planck and nothing else. But then you need to include loops. Uh, so this doesn't uh, work for M theory, no, that's the point. Or that's right. Theory. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I listed it as one of my assumptions. Yeah. Um okay. So um uh, so as I was saying, um, this is our, our assumption about causality, which will be the most important. In particular, crossing will be very, very important. Uh, we also assume that our theory is Lorentz invariant at all scales, and by that I just mean that the spectrum is organized by by the mass and the spin. Uh, Julio, uh, before yeah. you go on, can, can I ask about point number two? Are, are, yeah. are you going to are you going to explain a little more why causality is equivalent to crossing or analyticity? Uh, I, or I have a backup slide that is a bit technical. I can show you okay. my backup slide at the end. We okay. can discuss that if you want. Okay. Uh, but okay. uh, but I was planning. So this is where the meat is, as uh, yeah, as you're, you're just asking. Um, uh -huh. So uh, but but it's a bit technical. So um, it's also not completely well understood uh, in 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 all generality. Um, right. So yeah. I just want to understand then the lo basic logical structure. So if whatever you're imposing is going to guarantee that we have causal amplitudes. Yes. Yeah. Or okay. Right. Yeah. And it's not known if it's the other way around is okay. Yeah, it's known for some examples, but for the particular case of like four-dimensional scattering of massless particles, there's still some some questions. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So and then my last assumption is partial wave unitarity. So then in, in particular, I will assume that the imaginary part of the amplitude. Um, it's uh, it's uh, expandable in in partial waves. So in four dimensions, these partial waves are just these. Wigner diff functions, so essentially spinning versions of the Legendre polynomials uh, with some positive spectral density. Okay, so we have some spectral density here, which is positive. It's also bounded from above. Uh, uh, one could also try to impose uh, to see what the what the consequences of these upper bound are. I, we want that to we won't do that today. We'll just discuss the, the consequences of this being positive. Okay, and and uh, a useful way to think about this spectral density is as essentially the square of, of the coupling of, of your gravitons to some, some higher spin state. Okay, So you can think that, that this is uh, what you would get by computing some exchange diagram of some spin J particle. And, and these are the three-point couplings uh, of the graviton to, to that particle. Okay, um, 
So these are very reasonable assumptions, we think, uh, very basic assumptions. Uh, maybe uh, assumption number two is not completely well understood, but we think that all the other things are, are, are reasonable and and we'll see that we can get uh, a lot from, from this. So before I, I go on, let me let me pause here if there are more questions about this. All right, okay. Maybe oh, go ahead. you just repeat a little bit, I missed something, the last one, the intuition. Yeah, okay. So in, in general, this is just some spectral density. So this is gonna be uh, the, the the density uh, of, of uh, having particles with mass m squared and spin j uh, that interact for gravitons with some definite helicity and and the useful way to think about this is as as um, as um, the numerator of some diagram where you compute some spin j exchange for for graviton scattering okay and um, and that that means that essentially the spectral density is there's some product of of three-point coefficients, couplings which are graviton, graviton, spin j with mass m. Okay. Um, yeah. But in particular, these things, this is just whatever the spectrum is. So it, this doesn't mean that there is some like stable like particle with spin j. This is just any spin j in the spectrum. And, and we can make statements about these coefficients for 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 any state, not only things that would show up in your Lagrangian or yeah. Why is this an assumption? This is not something you can derive from general. Uh, I mean, well, the way you were explaining it now, it seems like something you can derive, actually, right? Like it's just well, the, it's, yeah, it's unitarity. I, I just wanted to say we're going to use unitarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course, more generally, this this is a matrix uh, depending on the helicity. So in, in in practice, this is a bit more complicated. Not every entry is positive, but it's some ah. possibly semi-definite matrix. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me let me continue. So let, let me just show you what these gravitational amplitudes that we study look like. Um, so they look like this. So the, we were going to study the MHV sector, two plus, two minus helicity scattering in four dimensions. There's some helicity weight, uh, and then there's some function of the Mandelson variables, which is crossing symmetric, and it has the EFT, EFT expansion as expected. So the first term is Einstein Hilbert, and then we have R cubed, R to the fourth, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so this is just to show you what it looks like, um, and and we will be putting bounds on on these things. And uh, about the UV, we don't need to assume much. As I said, uh, we don't know much. We take this kind of bottom up approach to to try to understand consistent UV completions, and and we we just assume that the UV it's Lorentz invariant, causal, and unitary, and we have this assumption about weak coupling. So Simon will say more about this later. Um, about the different scales, but uh, we will see that the relevant scale m uh, in our in our bounds will be the higher spin scale, in fact. And uh, and but one can also ask: uh, Will we find some um, consistency conditions on the UV or any constraints on the UV spectrum based on infrared consistency conditions? And we'll see that indeed this this is the case. Okay, so um, so this is the setup. Um, and the technical tool, so this is the, the most complicated slide that I will show you, the technical tool we will use are these dispersive bounds or dispersion relations. Um, so we're going to write a sum rule for the scattering amplitude. What, what is that? We, it's just some integral of the scattering amplitude weighted by some prefactor uh, over, over the complex plane. So it's some, some contour that you can think of the contour around infinity, so just a, a very large arc around infinity. And um, and I won't get into detail, but but some of the assumptions that we made uh, about unitarity and, and causality imply that amplitudes cannot grow too fast at infinity. So um, so my claim is that that this integral will vanish. Okay. And um, if we deform this contour towards the origin, uh, we're going to have uh, different different pieces. So we're going to have an integral over some discontinuities. Uh, uh, that might start at this scale of the physics. And then at low energies, we're just gonna have our EFT amplitude. Um, and the statement that the arc at infinity vanishes, the fact that if I take any one of these contours and I blow it up, I get zero, means that the contribution from this arc has to cancel the contribution along, along this branch cut, okay? Um, so, so this sort of uh, thing, this saying that evaluating this at low energies, which is the integral over this arc, uh, has to be equal and opposite to um, to the contribution along these these, these continuities, it's it's what we call a sum rule, 
And of course, on the left hand side, we will express this in terms of low energy Wilson coefficients. On the right hand side, this will be some unknown expansion into, into high energy states, but, but we have some constraints that will allow us to do the following. So the strategy is very similar to what people do in the conformal bootstrap. So if we can find a functional F, which is positive on the right hand side for all masses and spins. Okay, so this, this will have some partial wave expansion. I'll show you in the next slide. But if we can find a, a functional which is positive on the right, then we will get a bound on EFT coefficients from the left. Okay, by, by imposing the same functional on the left. And of course, this low energy contribution, it's it's uh, it's done at low enough energy, so we can we can trust our effective theory there. Okay, so uh, I'll show you in a second how this looks like, but what kind of functionals do people consider? Um, traditionally, people have considered these forward limit functionals, things where, where you take a bunch of derivatives around the forward limit of, of the amplitude, and then you go to the forward limit. So that's a class of functionals that one could look at, um, and but actually the functions we'll use look more like this. So we are just integrating the these, these sum rules or the amplitudes against some wave function, which tell us kind of the distribution on on the transverse space, and in particular that we localize the scattering kind of at, at small impact parameters at, at impact parameters of order one over the cutoff. Okay. Um, so okay, so this is complicated, but I think in the next slide it will become clear uh, what the building blocks are. But go ahead, sorry. There was a question. Yes. So I, I wanted to ask. So you, you're having this assumption that in the sum room the UV is positive, and you're you're saying that the the amplitude doesn't grow but too fast in the in the uh, in the UV. So like yeah. in, any, in any theory of gravity, if you go to the really deep, deep, deep UV, at some point you start producing black holes, right? So we also mm -hmm. have like a handle on the on how the scattering amplitude looks like at you know Planckian center of mass energies, right? So, so importantly, here we are considering uh, uh, integrals at fixed t, fixed fixed p squared. Okay. Uh huh. So, so the high energy limit here is not fixed angle scattering where you would produce black holes and all of those kind of things. It's a, it's actually the regular limit. Where, where you would expect more something like semi-classical <laughs> physics. So, uh, so, so it's it's a it's a different regime, I think, yes, yes, from yes. from the, the regime that, that you're describing. Yeah. So um, sending s to infinity here, you would never get into a regime where the two particles are within their sources radius. No, no, maybe I can add the uh, maybe I can have a comment on this. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. If you fix the impact parameter, then yeah, that, then eventually you hit the Schwarzschild yeah. radius. Right. But that we know exactly what happens there. Okay. The, the the probability that you go through goes to zero. So the scattering amplitude goes to zero. okay, goes to zero. Okay. So we know exactly what happens, and it's perfectly okay. bounded. Okay. <laughs> so is, is isn't that all you need to? Then you don't need to assume because this is the UV behavior of any scattering amplitude, right? In the deep UV, right? So it's... yeah, yeah, but but, but, but for, in... for, yeah. Yeah, Whether go it goes to zero or one is not going to matter so much to us. We just assume it's bounded. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 We so, just need that probabilities are bounded. Right. Yeah. What I'm asking is that then is, is this assumption is it not automatic in any theory of gravity precisely because of what you are what you're saying? I think I think no because we are, we are not fixing the impact parameter. <laughs> we are, we are we are we are, essentially we are we are sorry we are, we are fixing the impact parameter. Uh, but but it's it's not obvious that that. Uh, that the amplitude is bounded in this regular limit, uh, even though it's expected. And, and okay. actually, to prove it rigorously, it's only been understood in the last uh, last uh, years, essentially, how, how studying these kind of functionals allows you to prove a rigorous bound on the growth of the amplitude. Yeah. OK, thanks. Just a quick question from a non-expert. Um, what part of this this first step is unique to uh, a gravity theory or gravity amplitudes? Because it looks like what you're writing down is some sort of UVIR connection. And I'm curious whether this is just something that is it really a UVIR connection, or is this some property of scattering amplitudes from like analyticity that you could do in a non gravitational theory? So, so this in fact has been done before in non gravitational theories by by many people. Uh, and uh, the only thing that is there's something special about gravity that I will mention, uh, which is which kind of uh, which kind of subtractions, which kind of prefactors you can add here uh, um, to for, for, and, and have these integrals still converge? Okay, so so these these sort of these relations they exist for any effective field theory, uh, but there's something which is special about gravity, that, which I will mention. Yeah. But but yeah, so this this sort of connection between low energy Wilson coefficients and high energy partial waves you can always write down. All right. Uh, so oh, let me give sorry, you an sorry, example. Could I, could I just uh, um, ask for a little more clarification on the sum rule? Should yeah. I think of the sum rule as proven then or an assumption about decaying S? 
it's in, it's in the gravitational case. It's proven. Yeah, it's proven. It's proven. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you if well, at least if you apply this kind of functionals to the sum rule, it's proven. <laughs> um, I can I can say I can I can get more technical at the end if you want, but. Uh, but the bounds that we that we will show, that Simon will show, they're proven under the assumptions that I listed before. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me give you a very simple example. So this is the so I, I labeled the, the sum rules by some integer k, which had to do with what the prefactor that I had. Uh, you don't need to know what, what this is, this k, but this is the before sum rule. And if I evaluate the arc contribution at low energies. It's just some function of the Wilson coefficients and, and, and P, which was the, the impact, uh, the momentum transfer. Okay. And, and the other contribution was some discontinuity around some branch cut. So it, it was given by the imaginary part of the amplitude. And I told you that I can expand that positively into partial waves. And this is what the expansion looks like. So this is some expansion in these Wigner D functions. And it's, this is some positive average over the high energy spectrum. So this has to be summed over all spins and integrated over masses above the cutoff. Okay. So there's famous bounds from the forward limit that people have studied for, for many years. And so one can reproduce those very easily. So if we just take the, take the forward limit in the sum rule, then for instance, we would find that the only thing that survives is G4, all of these guys go to zero, and, um, and then all of these things go to one, and then one proves that, for instance, the G4 coefficient is positive, okay? So this is what people had done in the past using these sort of dispersion relations. But, but this, this doesn't answer the questions that I posed at the beginning. What, how, how big can the Wilson coefficients be? All right, so we need some, some new ingredient to, to, uh, to impose the different kind of, to find different kind of bounds. And, and this was realized uh, last year that the, the key ingredient that allows us to do better than this, better than just in, get either parametric bounds from, uh, from semi-classical arguments or just bounding the signs of some Wilson coefficients, um, the key ingredient is crossing symmetry. And, and the intuition is that uh, crossing symmetry tells you that there is more than some rule, more than one sum rule that measures every coupling. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that in particular means that we can take linear combinations of sum rules that vanish on the low energy amplitude. And uh, in other words, there's, there's some uh, constraint on the high energy spectrum uh, based on some infrared uh, property of the amplitude or some property of the amplitude, which is supposed to hold at any scale, which is, which is crossing symmetry as, as, as embodied in the, in the low energy amplitude. So I show you this before sum rule here, which I had G4, G3, G5, G6. And here you see that there's this other sum rule B5 that also has G5. Um, so I could take some linear combinations such that G5 drops out and then look at higher sum rules and then take the appropriate linear combination so that in the end, I, I get something which vanishes or just measures a few, few coefficients. Okay. And so this is an example of such sum rule. Um, so such a sum rule, uh, which we call usually null combinations and null constraints are things which are zero on the low energy amplitude and just tells us that some positive average over kind of high energy couplings have, has to be zero. And um, okay, so, so, so the sum here, here I'm, I'm using notation, this one, the sum actually starts at j equals zero, this one starts at j equals four. But for instance, here we, we learned something interesting about the UV, which is that there has to be a spin four state in the spectrum. Okay, we don't know if this is a composite or, or this is an actual particle, but this tells you that there has to be some spin four state Otherwise, uh, you cannot satisfy this sum rule because, okay, this sum is completely positive. The only term which is negative in this sum is j equals four. Um, so you see that that there's some there's some infrared uh, avatar of, of crossing symmetry tells us something about the UV spectrum. And ap apart from this being positive, it tells you that the heavy states must, must couple weakly because, because you need the cancellation to happen. Okay, so the coupling is to why, the- Why not, why not lower spin? What, what, what are you asking? A spin j equals three or two? Yeah. Or? Three. yeah, so as I said, this, this, I'm abusing notation here. The sum here for this term starts at j equals four. This is because of some angular momentum selection rule for, for the, the gravity. Spin four three doesn't contribute? No, so only it only contributes to this term. So I, I should have written essentially this is some, uh, this would be a sum from j equals zero, and this would be a sum from j equals four. Oh. Uh, But you're saying that just that itsy bitsy spin four cancels all the rest? 
Yes, which is why why the high energy states have to couple weak, more weakly to gravitons. Yeah. That's surprising. Okay. Yeah. And of course, you can check this for for your favorite amplitudes in, in string theory, and it will be true. <laughs> this is so. Let me just make sure I understand. So if you if you're trying to go to the regime where you would have formed a black hole, would you see that? Would you say that this means the bulk of it goes through a spin four state? Can you ask that again? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't you go to the regime. I mean, as we discussed, if you fix t, but mm -hmm. it goes larger and larger, s, at some point you will form you will form a black hole. That's right. And in that case, would you say that the black hole formation will proceed via a spin four state because of these intermediate couplings? I, I, I don't think so. And also remember that all, the, all of this proceeds under this assumption of weak coupling, which means that we can only control things at energies below Planck anyway. Um, um, so, um, so I think uh, um, this, is, this is modulo, uh, like the zero here is modulo uh, one over M Planck corrections, which I think might be relevant once you get to the regime where you would form black holes. I don't know if, if Simon uh, can yeah, comment maybe, also. Yeah. Let me a brief comment also that, right, right, in this notation is also a hidden integral over M. So this is some rule over all the spins and all the masses of every state. Right. So, so the spin four states that dominate the sum, the sum rule, the, the, right, there has to be a negative, there has to be a spin four state that contributes with negative term to satisfy the sum rule. But this spin four state could be much lighter than a black hole. We don't yeah. know anything about it. Yeah. And in fact, because of one of M10 downstairs, you expect string states or states that are much lighter than the Planck scale to dominate. Mm -hmm. Black holes are very much suppressed by one of M10. I see. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any more questions? So, 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 I think you said, but just to be clear, this could be, this spin for state could. Could it be like a composite? Could it be like a baryon or something like? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. But we, we cannot say there has to be a particle with with. Right. Things. So so right. this is is this to what extent is this telling you, for instance, that there are strings or something like that? Uh, we click. Uh, that's that's what I wanted to get. Um. Well, I mean, th this can be satisfied. By by a bound state of two spin two particles, so uh, okay. so in principle it doesn't tell you that that you must have strings. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. More questions? I'm almost done. So, I'll pass yeah, the back on to Simon. Um, Go ahead. The, if I assume that I mean I, I don't have only spin four but also higher spin like a full tower, is it clear then that should come from a string because of the fact that the higher spin should be weakly coupled? And that gives rise to some structure or how the different. I mean, you can study how the string satisfies the sum rule and check that it's true, but uh, but I think it, it's hard to use this uh, to to argue that that the only way to satisfy it is with a spectrum that looks like this string spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the uh, I you said that there that the other ones would also we like higher spin should couple weakly. Yeah, I guess that means that the higher the spin, the weaker they should couple. Yes, yes, such that, this, that this, some, this average is still zero, yeah. And that doesn't constrain much the, the type of spectrum, I don't know, like- Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't tried to, to put any bound, but I, I doubt that uh, one can uh, derive some useful constraint, uh, yeah. So we can use that uh, to, to put bounds on the low, low energy Wilson coefficients, but, uh, but I don't know of a strategy to, to use this to understand the UV spectrum itself, yeah. Okay, so let, me, let before I pass the baton to Simon, let me just tell you what's special about gravity uh, very quickly and why we can use this to get uh, like upper bounds on the Wilson coefficient. So what, what's special about gravity is that it satisfies anti-subtracted dispersion relations, meaning that we can actually multiply the amplitude by some function and this, this dispersive sum rule will still converge. And, and because I'm multiplying by something rather than dividing by something, then the contact terms do not contribute. So we have some rules that just measure gravity and, and say R cubed in four dimensions. And this means that we can find functionals that look like this. So when we apply this to, the, the, to uh, G cubed, we get zero. When we apply it to Newton, we get one. And that means that there's a sum rule that tells you that the a positive sum over this high energy coefficient, so this, this is again this average, um, uh, has to amount to G Newton at low energies. Okay. 
And that tells you again that all of these guys have to be weakly coupled, but now in a precise sense that, that the, the, the sum over the interactions and here every single term is positive. So here there's no cancellation. This means that every single one of those can amount at most to, to G Newton, okay? And, um, and this, this sort of sum rule essentially shows that gravity must be weakly coupled at all scales below Planck. And in, in particular, it guarantees that we will be able to derive bounds on couplings that look like this. So if you normalize the Wilson coefficient by, by enough powers of, of the energy scale, then you can have like an order one number times, times G Newton, okay? So just to and make sure I, I know what your definition of capital M is, M was the first mass where new state appears out of your EXP. Yes, that's right. Now in practice, I don't know if Simon will describe this, but in practice, we can add light matter, meaning spin less than two with any mass to the EFT and show that, that this is a higher spin scale. Um, and that qualitatively nothing changes in our bounds when, when, you, when you make that assumption. So we can pinpoint that this scale will be the higher spin scale uh, in, in a technical sense. Uh, Okay, uh, without make, making any assumption of some of the spectrum, just by including everything that we could have at low energies. And, and, and the conclusion is still, still the same. Okay. And by the way, this is very different from, from quantum field theory. So, so say you had a theory of pions, um, which is also non romanizable whatever. And, and there we have two options about, about the UV. We have pions, uh, like QCD pions, which are strongly coupled. And then we have things like the kind of longitudinal modes of a W boson, which which are weakly coupled. So this, this tells us that actually in gravity, we have only one option, uh, um, which is which is everything has to be weakly coupled at all scales below M plan. Okay. So, um, so Julio, can I ask? So, if, so sometimes, for instance, if you have a theory of, let's say, five-dimensional gravity, you put it on a circle. Mm -hmm. The five-dimensional M plank, which is the scale at which gravity becomes, uh, actual scale at which scales become strongly coupled, is below the four-dimensional M plank, mm -hmm. right? So, so how does that fit with, with this formula here? Like the, the, the scale with strong... Uh... So this is all in terms of the four-dimensional M plank. Um, so are you asking what, what happens uh, in, when you hit that threshold before, before you hit the four-dimensional M plank? Right, I'm saying, I'm saying you're saying gravity must always be weakly coupled before below 4D plank, right? Yeah. And for in, in, I think in examples, when you just take five-dimensional gravity and you put it in a circle, the, the five-dimensional M plank, which is the yeah. scale which you actually start producing black holes and the like, and which gravity becomes strongly coupled, is usually below the 4D M plank. Yeah, so this is, this is a puzzle. This is related to the question of what happens when you couple gravity to, uh, to a large number of, of light, like right, a right, right. large number of particles at, at low energies. And right. indeed, one can show that there is a violation of causality much earlier than 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 Planck, uh, oh. but, but this is something that that uh, we we haven't we haven't studied. But indeed, there's some breakdown of of, of EFT and and of some of these principles at a scale below below in Planck. Yeah, but but without describing what that what breaks down, let me explain why this bound is still correct, even if you have a five D compactification or a large number of matter fields. Mm -hmm. The point is that. When we say that gravity scattering remains weakly coupled, we mean that scattering of 4D gravitons is mostly transparent. Like most of the gravitons just pass through each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that is still true in Kelsa Klein reduction, just because it is a dilution of the, uh, of the, the, gra of the 4D graviton wave function. So, so if you do a scattering experiment above the 5D Planck scale of 4D gravitons, it's still true that they're weakly coupled in the sense that they just pass through each other. Uh -huh. yeah. They don't make black hole, they just pass through each other. Okay. One, one way to see that is that actually that like you don't have a process where you have graviton graviton KK mode, right? So our assumption of a weak coupling tells you that that you cannot produce these KK modes in the in the intermediate state in the, in if you're just coming from a compactification. And and this you can understand because the like the integral of the wave function of any KK mode over the compact space has to has to be zero, right? By orthogonality. Um, so, oh, so you, uh, you could produce like loops of Carlos Aquin modes, but that's not the right. same. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make sure here you mean absolute value of GI here in inequality, right? Uh, say that again, I, I couldn't hear you. GI cannot be very negative, I'm assuming also. So you mean absolute value of GI in your inequality? Yeah, so this is I mean this this also proves that gravity is attractive. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying is that the last inequality you're writing is you can make it stronger, right? You mean absolute right. value of GI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes. That's right. Okay, so uh, so let me just show you an example and pass the baton to Simon just so that you see something. 
So this is the sort of the functionals that we consider. We take these sum rules, we multiply them by some polynomial in P. We integrate it. So in four dimensions, we need some IR cutoff, but we integrate it all the way up to the UV cutoff, which we can because these sum rules only receive a contribution from a finite number of, of Wilson coefficients. And this plus some, some forward contribution gives us a functional that we can show that it's positive for any value of the mass and the spin. So there's some scaling limits that one can check. One can check for final values of the mass and, and the spin. Um, and, and we get a bound that looks something like this. So here, because of this R cutoff, there's a little bit of negativity, but it's bounded. So this means that we'll still find the sort of like parametric, like non-parametric bound, like order one coefficient bound with the scaling that you would expect from dimension analysis, say on the coefficient of R cubed in this in this example. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, so so you told us that uh, so the, this new uh, set of conditions are the ones that are specific to gravity. Yeah. So is there a way to see that if you take, for example, Newton constant to be zero, then uh, uh, then then this constraint disappears? Well, the, the, the thing is, this this constraint is written directly for the graviton amplitude, so it's a, a bit hard to 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 say what happens when when you turn off G Newton. You can turn yeah. off the graviton scattering and just consider scattering of gravitons through these higher dimension operators and and then you just lose this constraint there's there's nothing well, that goes wrong yeah 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 i mean um, well, it will say it gets stronger and stronger because like if you scatter massless spin two particles and you try to set g to zero what we show is that the wall amplitude go to zero yeah yeah that's that's the outcome of of the bounds which is i mean in this case this was already normalized by m Planck, but what we the bounds in general have a power of g on the right hand side as, as i said here Oh, okay. And we can show that the whole amplitude will will go to zero oh, based okay. on, on this on this uh, on this the existence of these sum rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is this is a proof that that every single Wilson coefficient will turn off as you turn off G Newton. Okay, so I think I took a lot of time already. So let me stop here and and uh, so let one continue. These yeah. are for pure gravitational terms. Do you have any similar statement for mixed terms? I'm gonna to come uh, to that in a minute. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me let me let me uh, let Simon explain uh, what we can get from this. Uh, yeah. Okay, just so you know, it's uh, we've already been talking for the five minutes. Uh, it's been okay. very interesting, so it's fine. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So time. yeah. Okay. Try to fit it in 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Uh, review this. Uh, review us before presenting the results. Let me uh, briefly review our setup and and okay, what we bound. So. So yeah, as I was explained, we study scattering experiment below the Planck scale. We have the the key scale for us is this higher spin scale, mass of higher spins. Uh, it could be light carries a Klein mode below it. It's not gonna matter. Uh, we could have standard model or sort of spin zero, spin one fields. Uh, we can also imagine that uh, the mass of the higher spin is below the standard model. <laughs> Maybe for astrophysics, that would be more interesting. <laughs> but, uh, but the key is that, yeah, we have this higher spin mass that's much less than the Planck scale. And we're starting scattering at, at energies and momentum, in, at momentum transfer that are slightly below it and energies that are above it. These are kinematics. Uh, what we actually bound, so you to, that, to, to discuss the question that was just asked, so we bound the things that we can measure in graviton scattering. Okay. So, so what are the things we can measure? So, so, so in four dimension, if you have a modification, if you had a Riemann cube term, that's, that's a coupling here that we can measure and, and Riemann four. And, and we're trying to bound how big these coefficients can be in absolute value. The, there's a lot of things that you can write down that we don't bound. Like you, you could ask like right why did not why did I not write R square? The point is that from the viewpoint of the low energy EFT, R is basically an equation of motion. So you can remove it by field definition, order by order. So there's no observable effect on graviton scattering. In fact, F of R gravity is exactly uh, is exactly equivalent to to pure Einstein gravity coupled minimally coupled to a scalar field with some specific potential. So, so, and we don't say anything about the potential of the scalar field. So, 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 so for us, f of, our, f of our gravity is not something that's constrained at all. Okay. 
the things that are constrained are power of Riemann tensor, not, not Ricci scalar or tensor. Okay. And we don't bound scalar energy. And the basic reason we don't bound scalar potentials is that these don't lead to effects which grow with energy. Like the, the, the some rules, the thing that's special about gravity, which led to this uh, superconvergence relation and so on, is that gravity is a, give you an amplitude that grows like S square. And, and we can write the question of S square in terms of EV physics. Yeah. But things that don't grow with energy, we don't bound with this method. Uh, and yeah, we can also discuss our sort of things that people call modification in GR, and maybe in some sense they are. For us, we don't call them modification of GR because they're just like adding more fields, but they're not necessarily have an input to graviton scattering. Okay, so the things that we bound there are the things that, that have a graviton scattering. So when you say you don't bound, do you mean that there's, your method doesn't help, you don't think any method involving scattering will help it? Ah, well, okay, then, so then we can study more, more, you can study mixed scattering. You could scatter photons against gravitons and you can scatter matter against gravitons. And from this, with the same technique, you will likely bound the our sort of higher derivative corrections to this theory. So that, that's an interesting exercise. It is in principle possible, yeah. But for pure gravity, if you had, if you had pure gravity, it was constant theory. If you had pure gravity, you cannot imagine any argument from scattering causality, unitarity, et cetera, to give bounds on f of r. Well, the point is that f of r is not pure gravity. It's gravity coupled to a scalar. And then you could scatter the scalar. Well. Gravity, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a relatively heavy scalar. Be more clear. By pure gravity, I mean no energy, pure gravity. Pure gravity, these could be corrections to the pure gravity in terms no, of. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, the reason we cannot bound this is that you, you can actually compute the, the, the four graviton scattering in F of our gravity, and it's exactly the same as in Einstein gravity. Like it, it, this theory that makes no different prediction at low energies. It's the same theory at low energy. If you have r plus r square, for example, the simplest case, you will have a scalar at the mass set by this new coefficient. But, but at this energy scale below that scalar, the theory is exactly Einstein. OK. So we, of course, we cannot bound it. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, if you have whatever the questions, please feel free, to, to, free, free, please, please free to, to ask them. Yeah. And, and let me briefly explain yeah, that. Question. Yeah, so this means that if I have two EFTs, which yeah. at low energies are exactly the same, but they differ by the UV completion, then yeah. these methods would never be able to give any constraint. No. I'm extrapolating what you said about gravity. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're viewing this as constraints on the low energies, but uh, I, I think it, it's giving you very little information about the UV. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to reverse that, I mean, it's probably an interesting question that should be asked. Like, what do we learn about the UV given given values of the IR coefficient? But but we haven't made progress on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, let me briefly explain uh, why spin four states are the key. So I'm going to give a physical argument, and 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 so 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 for example, we get a lot. It's very natural to get spin two particles from Kelsey Klein reductions, or. And uh, yeah, but but the thing is that you don't actually, if you scatter two gravitons, <coughs> I don't know if you can see my, you can probably may see my cursor, but maybe let me make a bigger cursor. Yeah, so so when you scatter two gravitons, it's actually hard to, to make a Kelsey Klein mode. And then even if there's no uh, conserved charge, which would prevent this, basically the orthogonality relation of wave functions within Einstein gravity makes this coupling zero. As was mentioned by by Julio, so so we don't actually expect Kelvin Klein modes to couple to to influence gra graviton scattering at three levels. So we expect at least some coupling, maybe some maybe you could imagine some derivative correction at the vertex or some loop effect or something, but you expect some suppression. And this bound is something that we actually show. We actually so we don't assume this something that comes out, but the couplings to spin zero and spin two states will always be such that coupling to two graviton will be suppressed by this higher spin scale. Okay. And this is a consequence of the sort of bound of the sort of relate some rules that you showed that relates particles of different spins. So the low spins are tied to what the higher spins do. So they cannot couple strongly. Okay. So, so the important scale for us is this higher spin scale. 
And OK, uh, you got this special relation. So that was usually the similar slide. So let me present results. Uh, actually, you do also at this slide. Uh, yeah, the, the, the cool thing about gravity, what's is special, is that because of the spin of the graviton, the scattering amplitude has these factors in front. And these factors grow with energy, at least in some, some channel, which means that the thing they multiply have to de decay faster. And that's why we get these anti subtracted, also known super convergence on roots, which we don't put any denominator downstairs. And, and once you found a magic combination with some rules, which prove that gravity is positive, then, then you basically dominate every other coupling. So everything has to shut down when G goes to zero. And, and yeah, we will not discuss this, but yeah, Yulio nicely reviewed the argument by C and Z. And let me just mention that this argument is automatically implied by the sum rules we consider. So automatically the sum rules that we get are going to reproduce this result, but then show something stronger. Because now we get, not just parametric bounds on these coefficients, we get sharp numerical bounds. So this is uh, this is one of our main plots that is showed. Uh, so you do show the upper bound on G3 square. So that's a quotient of our Riemann cube. You show the, show the bound that was rigorous, but far from optimal. This is the optimal one. And, and what you see, what's important about this plot is that it's bounded. The allowed region is bounded. So the coefficient in front of these terms, when you normalize them in unit of the higher spin scale, cannot exceed order one without having without causing causality violation of the scale higher spin. That's our main conclusion. These quotients are order one. I'm treating this infrared log as order one. If you put it numbers for our universe, you will understand why. <laughs> The, yeah, that is our bounds. Uh, what are the numbers for our universe? What is the IR in? Ah, I mean, yeah, so, so the mass of the IR spin, it, it's actually hard to tell, but let, 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 let's, let's treat it as a maybe electro weak something, okay? The IR scale is a bit hard to define. If you were doing this in ADS CFT, that would be the radius of ADS. Mm -hmm. Here for us, it, it, you would, I would say it's a scale where, uh, uh, yeah, I would define it as a scale where we, uh, 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 yeah, where, where the cursor space time becomes important. So even if you're very conservative and you put the Hubble scale in there, <laughs> a scale so log of Hubble scale over electro weak, sorry? And how would you do it in flat space? What, so, what scale? Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe let, let, let's emphasize the scale there. So, so you know, we, we, we're doing scattering experiments at low energy, much lower than, than the, uh, okay. If you imagine an actual collider experiment, like LHC-like, okay. This, the infrared scale there would be the size of the, the ring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you can be very conservative and put the size of the size of the universe there. But like in practice, it's the size of your scattering experiment. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I think about it. But this, these arguments that you are saying presumably apply to supersymmetric theory with Minkowski, which has Minkowski space as an exact vacuum, yeah. right? So in that context, what, what, it's a good question, I think, to know what, what would your bound be for MIR? Exactly. Yeah, I think, I think the, I think we have, you know, usually the divergence are the fact of, you know, we're asking an idealized situation involving particles going to, from, to and from infinity. And we get this log divergence it's just because of the one over R Newtonian interaction between these particles, which gives the, uh, which add up to a large time delay. So, so this, this, this log divergence has a simple and clear interpretation. It's, it's really just Newton. So, so in practice, I think that what that means is that the thing we should be doing is do a, a better defined experiment where you don't scatter things from infinity, but you scatter them from finite distance. And then you would have a physical distance in there. But you have, you can have our pretty larger and larger distances. What's the problem? Uh, all I'm trying to say is that, I mean, I can, I can ask about thought experiments. There's nothing preventing me from asking that. In the context of ever bigger and bigger experiments, in the Minkowski, you don't have any bound. 
how big you can make your 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 experiment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is this is a situation where making your experiment bigger makes you lose. You get stronger constraints from a smaller experiment because oh, I see. You go the because, other way. Go yeah, the yeah. Because we, we're trying to probe the scale, and we're trying to probe physics at the scale n. So throwing things from infinity is a very bad way to probe the scale n. Oh, okay. That that that's what's going on here. <laughs> Maybe just a comment also. So this log is there in four dimensions and only in four dimensions. So if yeah. you use the analogous methods in higher dimensions, you will show the same kind of bounds without any infrared logarithm. So I think that the, the punchline of the bounds, it's it's perhaps uh, murky by, by the log in four dimensions, but it's more general. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. yeah, when we do these bounds in higher dimension, they'll become completely finite numbers. Okay. Since, since you're saying that the log is related to really four dimensions, like some higher divergence, it, 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 could it be related to, to running of G3 and G4? Uh, like the, the uh, fact that it, it, no. it naturally has different values at different energy scales or? No, no, it's not. Because G, G3 over G4, uh, the running is suppressed by uh, M over M Planck. OK, OK. So that's very small effect. Uh, and so your, your G4 is always G4 at the, at the scale M. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Which, which differs by uh, G4 at, at the initial by a very small amount. OK. Yeah, thank you. So that's our main result. And let me, I just want to emphasize, uh, I want to spend a slide explaining, you know, what's important is bound is the way it scales with M Planck. So, so I'm just going to emphasize the scaling with M Planck. So, so like it's natural to ask, you know, in a gravity theory, what, 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 what does it tell us about the correct way to scale our derivative corrections with, with the cutoff? And, and here I'm, I'm showing like, there's actually like more than one reasonable option. Like if, if you ask an effective field theorist, like, I'll show you scale. They, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen all of these options in the literature, depending on who. But who you ask, like they are, they are, they're more than one natural way of scaling things because you have you have m Planck and you have this cutoff m. So in this scenario that we're talking about, where we have a cutoff that's much less than m Planck, then like one option would be like to put order one coefficient, just dimensional analysis like this, and, and say that uh, uh, Riemann cube over m square as to have an order one coefficient. This is what you get from taking a loop with order one number of particles in it. Uh, the other bound sort of thing you can ask is, you can ask, I'm gonna, I'm gonna my, my correction is gonna be such that it has an order one effect at the cutoff. So like it's an higher derivative correction that becomes significant at the scale n. So that's the other natural way to scale things. And finally, you can ask, uh, you, 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 you could put your, you could choose your criterion to be, well, this Riemann cube here contributes to three graviton coupling. And you're gonna impose that the three graviton coupling satisfies the unitary bound. So it doesn't exceed the uh, gravitons remain weakly coupled below the cutoff. And that gives you something like this, which has a different power of M Planck. So notice that these, these three bounds have very different powers of M Planck, okay? We show, well, okay, the first one is obviously too strict because it's not even true in string theory. The quotients are bigger than, than, than that. This scaling here is the scaling that was assumed by, by CEMZ, and that's the scaling that we, we prove is the correct one. So corrections to GR can never become parametrically significant, significant below the cutoff. And, and the other bound here, which allowed gravitons to be strongly coupled, is impossible. Graviton scattering has to remain weakly coupled below M Planck. And it can differ by a relative amount of order one at the cutoff. This is actually what happens at the string theory. It's modified by a relative amount that's order one, but it never parametrically exceeds. The correction never parametrically exceeds Einstein gravity. Let me say it differently. If you try to write down a gravity EFT and you're looking for a large effect, you're doing something wrong. A gravity EFT is always Einstein plus small. You can never get a parametrically significant effect from higher derivative corrections. Simon, uh, uh, unless M is close to M Planck. 
Yes. And then you would get the parametrically significant effect at the Planck scale, not before. Okay. But it's still true. The parametric, the parametric effect, the, the effects are only going to be parametrically important when the EFT breaks down. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. it, it can look like a trivial result, but I think it's, no, no, it's, it's a non-trivial result. So I want to repeat it in many different ways. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as any correction to Einstein becomes significant, your EFT must break down. Mm -hmm. That's it's very special to other, other EFTs don't work like this, it's special to gravity. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my result. And then, okay, I have a slide here to show that uh, you can also look at contact interactions and they're also nicely bounded in Unica and Planck. You can also correlate them with each other. Uh, this is a slide where I show a bunch of, 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 of theories. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll skip, I will skip the, skip the details of the slide. But yeah, when you look at some actual theories on this plot, you know, they're kind of all over the place, but it's a bit, uh, one thing we would be hoping is that we find some interesting theory at the cusp or at the edge of the allowed region. So far that has not happened. So the, uh, the interesting theories are kind of all over the place in the middle, but, uh, but, our, but our allowed region is not so much bigger than, than, than things. And also we have this. Uh, uh, excuse me. So in this presentation, the, uh, the issue with the infrared divergence cancels out? Exactly. So that's why I have to look at uh, yeah, I'm, I'm correlating to things. Actually, these these uh, IR derivative couplings they're less they're not sensitive to. Uh, so you get infrared divergence only when you try to normalize things by G Newton. If you take other ratios of couplings, they're fine. So this is like a Riemann four, and this is like Riemann four with some derivative. This this ratio is infrared safe. So so there are things that you can do that are safe and that are rigorously bounded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and I just want to contrast this uh, with the uh, previous bounds. So, so it was noticed before that the uh, in paper that really influenced us, uh, that when you compare the space of allowed theories with the bounds that you can obtain from forward limits, uh, it seemed before that the actual theories are more populate a very small fraction of the space, but we think this conclusion was a bit premature because now that we add in more constraints, we find that the, 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 the regions are much more commensurate with each other. So that's just a, a quick comment there. So Not when you say a bosonic string, heterotic string, are these compactified to four dimensions? Ah, it doesn't matter. They all have the same attitude. <laughs> ah, okay. <I laughs> because see. all this KK details decouples. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I see. Three yeah. level. At three level. At three level, yeah. But as long as the string scale is much less than Planck scale, the uh, three level is good. Okay. I wanted to show some a plot that I forgot. I don't have it. I have a similar plot with uh, uh, involving uh, M Planck downstairs. And again, we get a bounded ratio. But okay, maybe I can show come back to this plot here. Uh, one thing you can do on this plot is to put the, uh, you can put lines that describe what you get from loops of scalars or loops of uh, vector particles. So suppose you have N fields in your theory, then as you make N larger, you increase this bound. And, and what this plot show also is that if N is too big, you have a problem. So, so these plots also show that the, the cutoff, this higher spin cutoff has to be less than, if you have N particles running in a loop, you need uh, basically N Planck over square root of N. And in fact, there's a, this, this is IR, this, well, everything we have is as this IR log. But uh, if you can show, I just, just showed something with paper, but yeah, we get, the cutoff has to be less than M Planck over square root of n. So that's something we can see rigorously from these plots. Because if it's the loop, this is yeah. like the species bound. The... Yeah, this is like the species bound. Yeah. So you are saying that you can show rigorously the up to a log. Up to, yeah, a log. up to a log. Yeah. So something 
qualitatively has to happen. And, and the, lesson, the reason for this is simple. We've shown that you cannot have a large departure from mentioning gravity below the cutoff. So if you have too many like particles, too many like particles, your loop effects are going to make you going to give you a big corrections for mentioning gravity. And we cannot have that. Below the plan, gravity is to look like below the cutoff, we need to have gravity plus small, Einstein plus small. As and that implies that if you have many fields, then this, this capital M have to be lower. Has to get lower, right. exactly. Exactly. Time. Yeah. That's nice. Yes. So we have this version of the species bound. And I'm basically done. Uh, at the, ah, yeah. And I, that kind of, this is the most phenomenological slide on this. Uh, this talk is not very phenomenological. There's a question like, what do we know about this higher spin state? You know, people doing string theory are used to think about the string scale as very high. <laughs> but, but we're not assuming here that this higher spin physics, we don't know yet that it really has to look like string theory. So, so we, we did this exercise in the paper where we contemplated the option as M higher spin is like much less than collider physics, you know, like one EV or something like this, right? This is the thing you need. If, you, if you're going to see, if you, if you want to see effect from higher derivative corrections in astrophysics, you know, you, you probably need this higher spin scale to be like, you know, 10 to minus 10 EV or something, just, you know, the, 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 the Compton wavelength of, of these big black holes. <laughs> so, so, so do we really know that higher spin particles of this type cannot exist? And the, and the basic issue is that I think it's very, it's actually very constrained from colliders. And, and the basic issue is that if you have a higher spin particles, well, if you have a higher spin particle that couple with gravitational strength to quarks, for example, it, the amplitude for producing it will be Planck suppressed. However, it grows with energy very fast. So even if it's like MEV, you, you might see it because of this energy growth, basically because there's one over M downstairs. And if it's lighter, you will see it even more easily. So it's very hard actually to hide a light higher spin particle from collider. You could try to hide it by modifying this diagram. So in string theory, you don't get this growth, but that's because you don't just, on this, on this virtual propagator here, you don't just get a quark, you also get stringy version of the quarks. But if the amplitude is softened by this mechanism, then you can see this stringy quark even without radiating the spin four particle. And that, that we know that from, from LHC, we have, that, we have constraints on resonance of string-like resonance of quark are bounded to like seven to be, they must be heavier than seven TV or something. So, so the, even in your best attempt of hiding a spin four particle by not having stringy effects on other fields, you will still see it at colliders if it's too light. So anyway, it's difficult to be exhaustive in this business, but we, we asked this question, like, can you, could you really hide it? And, and our conclusion is that it would be really hard to hide a higher spin particle. But uh, this needs to be studied more by studying you know, the interactions between this higher spin particle and, and, and standard model fields, not just the couplings to gravitons. So, so yeah, in summary, I, I think our main take home message, let me repeat it in, in different ways, that gravitational scattering below some higher spin scale cannot significantly differ from GR without causality, without biasing causality. And we learn this by studying scattering of gravitons and then using standard axioms of S matrix theory. And, and yeah, we, we, we study this in the regime where we expect loops to be suppressed by, by some factor. This should be explicitly checked. We need to, we need to study those loop effects. Uh, another direction is to remove these infrared logs, which are really annoying in our bounds. I think if you if could study dress scattering amplitude or things which are like experiments that occur in a finite size region, then they should get, get stronger bound. This is gone. Uh, that, that would be interesting to, to do. Also in higher space-time dimension, everything's finite. 
uh, yeah, maybe we'll find a place where weak couple string theory is there. So far, weakly so far, string theory is in the middle of our plots. It's not near boundary, so we don't say much about string theory. But uh, yeah, we can ask about that. We can also about ask if there are stringy features. For example, when you hit this higher spin scale, like do you need all matter fields to have string-like excitations, or like what? Maybe we can look for some features that are string-like in, uh, in in theories. But yeah, so far, this higher spin particles, it could be associated with string theory, but it could be completely different. We really don't know what, what happens at this higher spin scale. Okay. And, and it's a different class of question one can ask. There's actually some interesting progress on this by uh, my group that I haven't mentioned by uh, Viera, Guerrera, and sorry, I forget uh, the, the third order, but they studied Scattering of gravitons in higher dimension, instead of asking how big can the correction to GR be, they ask how small can they be? <laughs> like how close to GR can you be? And they show that you cannot be too close to GR and the closest you can be seems to be somewhere along the modernized space of string theory. Mm -hmm. that, that's important as well, but it's the opposite question than the one we ask. Okay, so that's all, thank you everyone.